Our scripture reading comes from uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 22. 1 Peter chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? But even if you suffer for what is right, you are blessed. Do not fear their threats. Do not be frightened. But in it, your hearts reveal Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks to give a reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. For it is better, if it's God's will, to suffer for doing what is good than for doing what is evil. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He, has put to he was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago, when God waited patiently in the days of Noah, while the ark was being built. And only <clears throat> in it, only a few people, eight and all, were saved through water. And this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience, a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. Please pray with me. Loving, gracious Father, thank you for giving us this chance to worship you. Thank you for giving us all a chance to live in light of the victory that you've given us. Allow us to humble ourselves. Humble ourselves before you and humble ourselves before your great love for us. Lord, I am broken and I am a sinful man. So my hope is that you would get me out of the way. Get me out of the way so that your words of hope, your words of peace and comfort, even your words of challenge would come through me. So that all of us may grow into who you've created us to be. We pray these things in the name of Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. That the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be loving and acceptable to you. Our rock and our redeemer. Amen. All of us at one time or another have experienced a defeat in life. And I think that those defeating times are made even worse whenever we think everything's going to be okay, the coast is clear, and then wham, from out of nowhere, we get knocked right back down. <coughs> in some ways, we feel a little bit like Boris. Boris was a villain in the James Bond movie, Goldeneye. Anybody seen Goldeneye or remember it? Every time Boris narrowly escaped being caught, he would jump up and say, yes, I'm invincible. That is, until the very end of the movie. Tried to throw him off the cliff and he escaped death there. And another time it was the Pharisees. 
started, were trying to stone him, and he was able to escape death there. But when he entered in Jerusalem for the last time, he looked invincible. People were cheering for him. They were excited that he was there. They thought, yes, finally, someone is going to rescue us from the oppression of the Romans. But just as liquid nitrogen fell on the boards when he thought everything was going to be okay, everything soon fell apart for Jesus. It fell apart when people realized that Jesus had not come to give them victory over the Romans like they thought. Eventually, it led to Jesus' death. But the good news is, the good news is that Jesus' death is not the end of the story. Instead, in many ways, Jesus' death was just the beginning. The beginning of his total victory. This morning, we're continuing our series on the Apostles' Creed by considering what the total victory in Jesus looks like and what it means for us. But before we do that, I thought that we could recite these phrases in the Apostles' Creed that describe the total victory that we find in Jesus, this foundation of our faith. <clears throat> okay, it's printed in our bulletin. One more. Ah, sorry. And it's also up on the screen. Um, it says... He descended to the place of the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there, he shall come to judge the living and the dead. As we consider the total victory that we have in Jesus, the aspects of his victory are going to begin with the letter P just to help us all with memory. So the first way in which we can find total victory in Jesus is that we can find victory from within. The Jewish folks of Jesus' day wanted victory from without or outside of them. They thought if only the Romans were kicked out, then life would be great. <coughs> and many times, that's the kind of victory that we want. And we want Jesus to bless. If only we had victory over those Democrats or Republicans. If only we had victory over North Korea, ISIS, or, or even the Michigan Wolverines, <laughs> then life would be great. The list could go on, right? But Jesus did not come to win a political victory over the Romans. Alexander Schultzenitsen said this, The line separating good and evil passes not through states, nor between classes, nor between political parties either but right through every human heart and through all human hearts. When we look at Christ's death, we realize that in all of our hearts, there is something that doesn't want to always do what is right. That in our hearts, there is something that wants to abide in sources of death. We see this in Christ's death. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians Chapter 15 lays it all in the light. He says that if Christ is still dead, if he has not been raised from the dead, our faith is useless. We are still in our sin. He says that if Christ has not been raised from the dead, it is all a sham. We are liars, is what Paul writes. And the reason why is because if God was not willing to defeat the sin in the hearts of his own son's murderers, why think he wants to defeat the sin in my heart and in yours? But Paul continues in 1 Corinthians 15 and it tells us that Christ has been raised from the dead. He has been raised from the dead to give us total victory from within us. If God was willing to have victory over the sin of killing his own son, certainly he can have victory in our hearts as well. This is why Peter says, in our reading, that Christ died for sins, the righteous, that's Jesus, for the unrighteous, that's us, so that we could be brought closer to God. So what is the victory that we find in Jesus from within? Our first P is that we have purity. We have purity from sin. This means at least two things. First of all, you cannot out -sin God's grace. Did you hear me? Amen. You cannot out -sin God's grace. If God was willing to defeat the great and terrible sin of crucifying His only begotten Son in the resurrection, He will also defeat the sin within our own hearts. Amen? Amen. 
You cannot outsin God's grace. The second thing it means is that Jesus did not die and resurrect from the dead just to forgive us of our past sins. Instead, he came to give us true purity, which did not only break the guilt of sin, but also the power of sin. That we can be freed from the shackles of those sinful thoughts, behavior patterns, and thought dispositions that lead us to death. We can be freed from those. Ravi Zachariah, Ravi Zacharias puts it perfectly when he said that Christ did not come to make bad people good. He came so that dead people could live. In our sins, we are dead in our souls. And through Christ's death, our sinful hearts can die. And through his resurrection, we can be pure from sin. We can be saved from it. As the Holy Spirit renovates our hearts, we begin to live new lives. Lives in which we are pure from sin. Peter puts it this way. We can have a clear conscience before God because we trust in Jesus. And in that, we can be pure from sin. But the problem is, that's not the only kind of victory we need. I mean, what about the pain that comes from outside of us? How does Jesus have victory from the attacks from outside of us, the pain that they cause? If, if Jesus' victory is total and his victory includes attacks from outside of us, does that mean that when we trust in Jesus, we won't experience pain or suffering? There are prosperity preachers who teach us that the victory that Jesus gives us is victory over any pain or suffering. All you have to do is think happy Jesus thoughts and everything will be okay. Has anyone heard this? This is false teaching for at least two reasons. The first reason is it doesn't line up with scripture. Think about it. If the victory that God gives us includes victory over experiencing pain, suffering, financial difficulty, and relational difficulty, who have we just left out? See if you can guess who I'm talking about. He was born poor, and he worked a blue-collar job. His family thought he was crazy. His friends abandoned him, and he was brutally executed. I'm not trying to overstate my case. But maybe... Just maybe, if a life lived pleasing to God doesn't include Jesus, maybe our vision is wrong of the victory that God gives us. Maybe the victory God gives us isn't a victory from an easy and cushy life. This leads to the second, and I think, underlying problem with this kind of theology. It has us focus on the wrong kind of victory. That in Jesus, we do not have a Savior that conquers despite pain, suffering, and evil. Instead, we have a Savior that conquers straight through the deep, dark mystery of evil. That's why Peter teaches that if we experience persecution, if we experience pain for doing what is right, we should count ourselves blessed. We should count ourselves blessed because in it, we get to identify with Jesus. And in identifying with Jesus, we get to become more like Him. Now, does this mean does this mean that we should be happy about it whenever we suffer in this life? Of course not. When Jesus suffered, he was not happy about it. He actually begged his Heavenly Father, let this cup come from me. Uh, pass from me, I should say. He was in anguish facing his own suffering. So whenever we are in anguish, whenever we're in anguish over the loss of a job, Whenever we're in anguish because we or someone we love is in the chains of addiction, whenever we're in anguish because we've lost someone we've loved, they've died, we are not supposed to pretend like we're happy about it. Instead, we are to hold on to the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. The victory we have in Him comes in the form of hope that we have in Jesus Christ and assurance that in Him we will eventually experience victory. The writer of Hebrews reminds us that we do not have a great high priest who is unable to, uh, unable to sympathize with our suffering. Instead, in Jesus' suffering, he identifies with our suffering. And in his resurrection from the dead, he shows that he can redeem our suffering. So how does Jesus give us victory from the pain outside of us? Our second P is that he gives us peace. He gives us peace in the knowledge that any suffering we endure will be redeemed one day. Jesus' crucifixion was defeated by the resurrection. 
His suffering was redeemed in the resurrection. In the same way, anytime we suffer, we can trust in him that our suffering will also be redeemed. We can have peace and that knowledge in the midst of suffering and pain. And it's good news. It is good news that God purifies us from the sin within. It's good news that he gives us peace in the knowledge that our pain and suffering will be redeemed someday. But how on earth, how on earth can we say that Jesus' victory is total when we live in a broken and in a fallen world? We look around us and we see the pain and evil and suffering and we do not feel victorious, we feel defeated. In the Apostles' Creed, we acknowledge that Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty and from there he will come to judge the living and the dead. The reality is, is that when Jesus was crucified and resurrected from the dead, it was not just an isolated event. Instead, it was an event of cosmic significance. It was an event that reached all the way back to the beginning of human history, undoing Adam's first sin. That's why Peter teaches that Jesus went and proclaimed to the imprisoned spirits that those who had died before Christ's opportunity to trust in him. But it also looks forward to the end of human history. We read about this in Revelation, where John describes for us that one fine day when Christ returns, he will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more mourning, crying, or pain. This old order of things in Christ will be done away with, and he will make all things new. In Christ's death and resurrection, we have more than just someone raising from the dead, which is already a pretty big deal. Instead, we have the beginning of a revolution, a revolt against pain, evil, and even death itself. So how does Christ's total victory apply to the brokenness in this world? In his resurrection power, we see the beginning of a revolution. And the questions we ask ourselves are, am I participating in this revolution? Am I allowing Christ's resurrection power to give me new life here and now? Am I being obedient to the Holy Spirit as I invite others into that life as well? Are we just worried about our own privileges, our own wants, our own deeds, fighting and scratching for ourselves, or are we living in light of the victory that's already been won for us? When considering the victory that's won for, already been won for us, I think about Stephen, the very first Christian martyr. Stephen, uh, whose story is found in the book of Acts, is being drugged out to be stoned to death. He looks up and he sees Jesus at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And seeing the victory that's already been won for him, for us, what does he say? He says, forgive them, Father, for they don't know what they're doing. Think about this. He had pity and compassion for his murderers because he knew that the fight they were fighting, they would never be able to win. He had confidence in the victory that had already been won for him by Christ's resurrection power. In Stephen's story and in Christ's resurrection power, we realize that total victory, eternal victory, doesn't come when we jump up and say, I'm invincible in our own strength. Instead of jumping up, total victory comes in bowing down. Bowing down and surrendering to the Holy Spirit so that we can experience Christ's resurrection power. And it is that power that we affirm in the creed. The power that Christ used to rule and reign as he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And you know what the exciting and terrifying truth is? Until he returns, Christ has decided, has chosen to rule and reign through his faithful church. That it is the church who points people to Jesus so that they can be purified of their sin. That it's the church that points people to victory they can find in Jesus and the peace of knowing that their pain and suffering will be redeemed. And it's the church that exalts and praises and worships Jesus whose resurrection power is already defeating and will one day completely defeat evil, pain, and even death itself. This reorients everything we think we know about church and the reason why we're here. We are not here for our own sake. The church doesn't exist for its own sake. We are not here, as I heard one person say, for butts and bucks. 
We're not here to fill the pews and to fill the offering plate. We want to fill the pews and we want to fill the offering plate so that we can invite others into this life of total victory. A life where we can have victory over not only the guilt but also the power of sin. A life where we can have victory in knowing that all the pain and all the suffering we are experiencing now will be redeemed. A life of victory where His resurrection power enables us to live new lives. A life where we belong to Christ. And we find victory because we know whose we are. Please pray with me. Lord Jesus, send your Holy Spirit so that we can experience and participate in the total victory we find in Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.